Dan's giving me the opportunity to talk about algorithms. And just for a bit of news that's been coming up recently, have any of you guys heard of this insane security worm that's been floating around? Yeah, it's, been, it's actually been around for a couple of years, but there was an article published by some security researchers a couple of days ago saying that although we discovered this, although we came up with software to remove, remove it years ago, what we're finding out now is that if you look at the computers still here in the US, there are about 500,000 of them that are still infected with this, this virus, this worm, including about 50% computers in about 50% of the Fortune 500 companies and about 50% of the US government agencies. So that's a little bit alarming because what this worm is actually able to do is redirect any traffic when you go to do a search or you go to do anything in a web browser. It can actually change the destination of where you're going to whatever it wants. So uh, the guys who are running this, the people who are running this have made something like $15 million so far off of like advertising from directing people to wrong sites and stuff. And it's still rampant, which is kind of amazing. So you start to appreciate the scale of these viruses and the number of computers that they can infect and how hard it is to actually get rid of it, almost like a real disease. Right? So we'll be talking more about security-related stuff later. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to talk after, the, after class. And I've got a video for you. Yeah, we've got a timer right here. One thing to note is that they get a little time to observe the pattern, but they can't do any rotation. And then the timer starts when they're able to start doing rotation. OK, so, so keep your eyes out for that. And then they spend like the next 20 seconds congratulating him for you know, setting a world record at 15 years of age. Interesting fact, he actually bought his first Rubik's Cube like a year, two years before doing this. So you can still do it, guys. Hang in there. <laughs> anyway, so how many people here think he was just randomly spinning that Rubik's Cube? That's what it looks like. But how many people actually think that? Nobody. OK. How many people think there may have been some sort of pattern to what he was doing. Let's see it. Wonderful. OK, wonderful. There's actually a name for that pattern. Does anyone know? Oh, no. oh very good. OK, <laughs> you're ahead of me. Yes, so there's a name for the particular rotation pattern he was using that I don't remember right now. But if you Google it, you can find it. But what that pattern is an example of is an algorithm. Exactly. So. So an algorithm more generally, from a computational sense, an algorithm is a well-defined computational procedure. Let's take this piece by piece, right? Well-defined computational procedure that takes a value or set of values as input and produces a value or set of values as output. OK? Does this sound familiar at all? Like a definition we may have learned? Function, nice, nice. OK, so there's actually a lot of parallels between functions and algorithms. We're going to talk about what some of those, uh, those parallels are specifically later. But essentially, if you think about algorithms versus function, functions, an algorithm is going to be the conceptual equivalent. Okay, So it's, it's more of an idea than something you can actually do. Once you do it, it becomes an implementation. And here, it's more of a conceptual thing you can talk about. You can draw on a whiteboard, that kind of thing. Okay? Or you can write on paper in lab, for example. So algorithms are things all of you are familiar with, whether you've called them that or not. Many of you have probably not called them algorithms. But if we go back in time, we have actually been out building algorithms since the beginning. right? If you think about the non-computational equivalent, the conceptual equivalent to an algorithm could be something like a dance, something like a recipe, something like a set of instructions for building a wheel. Right? Things we've been doing since the very beginning. Those are conceptually equivalent to algorithms. Let's think about a recipe for a minute. If you have a list of steps, which every recipe does, you have a set of inputs, ingredients, and a 
intended output. And if you are decently good at putting those inputs and running some sequence of steps on them, you'll get the, the recommended output, right? Regardless of who you are or like, you know, what language you speak, your skills with cooking to some degree, right? So it's, you see a, a recipe is a conceptual thing and anyone who chooses to implement that produces food according to that recipe. It's exactly the same thing with an algorithm, okay? Cool, and some of the earliest mathematical algorithms actually came up, you know, three and a half millennium ago, which were things like factoring numbers, finding square roots of numbers, and that was work done by the Babylonians. So um, those are things we still do today. So let's think about some algorithms that you guys are already familiar with and actually use, right? Multiplication, human multiplication, which is different than machine multiplication. But if you get two numbers that you need to multiply, I bet everyone in here can multiply them, right? By hand, just doing that little thing you learned back in elementary school, right? What's well, step one of the multiplication algorithm? Yep, just down, right? Down that, left, down that right column, we got this. The seven and the four, you multiply those, and you carry the extra bit over to the next column, right? And then multiply, and then you come up with two products, you add those together, right? Old school. This is an algorithm, it's a set of steps, two inputs, and it produces an output, right? Raising a number to a power, three to the third, Help me out. Nice, nice. Okay, how'd you do that? You just did it? How'd you do it? Share the secret with the rest of people who couldn't do it in under 5.66 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and how many, how, how? Three to the third. Three times three times three. That's the way we learned it back in the day. How do you do? 100 to the fourth, 100 times 100 times 100 times 100, right? That's the algorithm for humans for finding numbers raised to powers. Okay, we good? Cool. Computationally, let's think of some algorithms we've already done, some algorithms we've already been over this semester, okay? Things like finding the length of a word. Determining whether a word appears in a list. Whether the list is sorted and picking a random element. Okay? Those sorts of things are things that you should be able to start thinking about, maybe not in terms of blocks, but how you would conceptually work through the idea of a list and maybe doing certain things to each element, although it doesn't necessarily have to be in terms of, of blocks. Let's just hold questions until the break, if that's, if that's cool. Okay, so these would be conceptual things again that if you build a function would become an implementation of an algorithm in a particular language, okay? So some commonly used algorithms. Things like finding the length of a list is interesting, but applications these days require things that are a bit more powerful. So here are some things that are widespread, some things that are used in a lot of different places, or at least conceptually used in a lot of different places. How many of you guys have heard of PageRank? Anyone? Okay, some people. How many people have heard of EdgeRank? Less people, but a couple. Good, okay. So PageRank is one of the innovative ways that when Google came about, they were able to measure the importance, the significance of certain websites. Why CNN.com might get more, might be a better source for news than my personal blog, right? Which it is. A couple other algorithms. The LUN algorithm. This is how you identify a sequence of numbers as something that could potentially be a credit card number. Okay? We'll have a, actually a practice problem involving the LUN algorithm for you guys later this semester. But if, if, Let's say the government or someone is scanning the internet looking for credit card numbers. Maybe not the government. Let's say some sketchy organization <laughs> is scanning the internet looking for credit card numbers. If they find a sequence of numbers, it could be a telephone number. It could be, 
It could be a bunch of other things, an address. One algorithm lets you check, put in a number, and it says true, false, that is or is not um, a credit card number. Could or could not be a credit card number. And there's the list, if you go and look up like lists of algorithms, it's literally some of, some of the largest articles on Wikipedia are the list of algorithms. There's just absurd numbers of these sorts of things. Okay, so one important thing to note about algorithms is because they are conceptual, there are often more than one way to go about solving a particular problem, right? Which is something that you've probably noticed in, in lab. So if you look at the person working beside you and you look at yourself, you may have two different ways of getting to the same problem. You're taking two different algorithms, two different conceptual paths to the same solution, okay? And if you think about multiplying numbers, maybe the algorithm I just described for multiplying numbers, you, you were sitting there, you're like, oh man, that's not, that's not how I've been doing it all this time, right? Like that's, that's not what I learned in third grade. Which is okay, as long as it works. Multiple approaches to the same problem, right? There are, however, trade-offs. So especially in the computational world, one thing we like to be able to do is do stuff fast. That's why computers are useful in the first place. So, we're going to talk a lot more about this the next time, but trade-offs come into play. Certain algorithms will be better for certain reasons. And just to give you a little sample, some, how could one algorithm possibly, better, possibly be better than another one? Any guesses? <coughs> faster, right. So speed could be a big thing. You could have two algorithms. One will just be faster than the other. One will require less memory than the other. <coughs> one gives you a certain probability of giving you the right answer. And one guarantees that it's going to find the right answer. So there's a bunch of different trade-offs that are going to come into play. And depending on your particular application, different algorithms will be a better choice. Cool. Okay. And that'll be actually the subject of next lecture on Wednesday. Cool. Okay. So there are a huge number of ways. As you guys are, are probably starting to imagine already, there are a huge number of ways that you can start to tackle some of these problems. The shortest, probably most useful list for starting off is these three general approaches. Brute force is often what people fall back to because it's usually the easiest thing to write. Has anyone heard the ter term brute force before? Cool, okay. Since computers are so fast, one technique that we can, can often use is just trying everything until you find the right answer, right? You just try stuff and try stuff and try stuff and hey, since computers are fast, you can just try a lot of stuff, right? In a lot of cases, this works. Some applications, though, things like, well, there's a lot of applications. Things like trying to create a computer that can play chess amazingly well. Things that trying to, like trying to predict the weather a week from now. These aren't the kinds of things where you can just try every possibility and hope, for, hope something will work out. Right? A lot of cases, though, brute force is the easiest way to get started on a problem. Two other approaches are, are what's referred to as top-down and bottom-up. These are phrases that exist a lot in other, other areas. Um, so if you consider from an architectural perspective, right, the, the campus of Stanford versus the campus of Berkeley, one of them is relatively top-down, and one of them is very much bottom-up. Any guesses which might be which? Berkeley is really, really bottom-up, right, yeah. So Stanford, you can imagine, if you guys have been to Stanford, you look around and a lot of the buildings look the same, right? There was clearly some planning that went into styling the way <coughs> things looked and they decided red and tan are gonna be like our thing, right? That's an example of top down. You come up, you look at the problem at a, as a whole, building a campus, and you structure it from the top and then start working your way down to say building individual buildings, okay? Bottom up is the opposite. Bottom up is Berkeley, right? You come and you just ask the guy, hey, what material do you have? And they say, I've got lumber. And they say, it looks like we're getting a lumber building, <laughs> right? <laughs> or we need a computer, computer science building. What do you have? Oh, I've got some tile. Let's make it out of tile, all right? All right. Math building, concrete. <laughs> And here we are, <laughs> right? Bottom up, thinking about subsets of the problem, 
building an individual building as opposed to trying to build a campus. It all depends on your perspective, and certain problems lend themselves better to looking at them one way or, the, or another, as does software engineering in general. So if you think about building an entire software tool, you might want to start from the bottom, working on indi individual functions and components, or you may want to start at the top, thinking about how your whole thing's going to flow together and then work your way down, or some hybrid of the two. And actually, you guys are going to probably start to, to develop some preferences um, as, we work on, as you work on further homeworks. As I was just explaining, just to go over it again, so a function to, to disambiguate the two. A function or a procedure is an implementation, an actual like, written code for an algorithm. That code can often be written in multiple ways and in multiple languages, in any language, in fact. Algorithms themselves are just conceptual descriptions of them. Here's something we didn't quite have enough time to get to last time, <laughs> and it's always a little bit fun. And this dips into co computer theory a little bit, okay? So buckle up for just a minute. A language, a programming language, BYOB, for example, is Turing complete, okay? You don't know that phrase yet. Turing complete is a qualification for a language that says it is as powerful, functionally powerful, as any other language that can ever be written for computers as we know them today. Okay? The, nothing can be done in any other programming language, Java, C++, Python, any of the languages you've ever heard of, that cannot be done in BYOB. And that is because of this very famous and incredibly important theorem called the Turing completeness theorem, okay? So if you have a language that is called Turing complete, if it falls into this category of languages that is Turing complete, that means it cannot be, it is just as powerful as all the other languages that are Turing complete and cannot be more powerful, right? Like a level five mutant or something, right? You can't, there's nowhere to go. You're, you're at the top. The, so how do you know if a, if a language is Turing complete? There's an analogy that was made by, by the author, Alan Turing, whose name I believe has already come up, that discusses a, a conceptual device called a Turing machine. Okay? And this is like, this is an old school VHS tape. Okay? Let's think that. Except it's infinitely long, right? So on either side, it's got an infinite amount of tape, conceptually, again. All you can do with a Turing machine is rotate this tape one way or the other, read data from it, which can be either a one or a zero, binary, write data to it, and then operate based on the data you get. Okay? That's all the things you can do. So you can slide around, grab a one or a zero here, slide around, grab a one or a zero here, say, okay, I got a one and a one, what does that mean? And then write the answer somewhere else. Okay, pretty simple. Pretty powerful. That's a Turing machine. So a Turing machine would be a specific one. So you come up with a, a Turing machine to multiply two numbers, let's say. Okay, so here it is. Whoosh. Conceptual, so you can't see it. A universal Turing machine is a Turing machine that accepts other Turing machines as part of its input. <laughs> Everybody okay? So you've got a Turing machine, it's got its tapes, and then you've got a universal Turing machine, and you say, here, universal Turing machine, take this Turing machine. Okay? And here's some inputs I want you to pass to it. The universal Turing machine can investigate this, the one you pass to it, read its tapes, look at what it does, look at its table of operations. So if you, if you pass in the multiplication Turing machine, and it's got all these rules, like if you read a one right here, then you should slide to the right three and then write, or you've got all these rules, right? 
The universal Turing machine can read those and simulate them. That's all it's trying to do, is try and figure out what that thing was doing and then do it. But it can do multiplication for a while, then you take that one out, you put it over here, and then you get the factoring numbers one and you put it in. And the universal Turing machine can run that one too. Okay? So a Turing complete language is a language that can simulate a universal Turing machine. With only those, I think there's six operations, right? Reading, writing, moving to the left, moving to the right, and operating on what you find. And I think doing nothing counts as an operation as well if you want to include that, right? Okay? Which sounds crazy for a minute, but I actually, I challenge you to think about anything you ever do on a computer that's different than that. Reading information, writing information, and operating on the information you find. That's actually all we can do. So if you have the capability to do that in any language, then you have the same capability that any, any other language does because there's nothing else to do the way we design our computers today. Okay? Okay, so in addition to some of the trade-offs we, we talked about earlier, things like speed, things like uh, memory requirements. There's also, of course, the importance of being right, of being correct. And this is something that actually isn't always important, but is usually important. It depends on the problem, and let me explain. So, in most cases, in almost every case we're going to use to talk about here in this class, total correctness is actually what we want. Okay? So the idea that if you build, let's say you actually implement an algorithm, right, and you build a function. If it's totally correct, then any time it reports an answer, that answer will be correct, and it will always report an answer. Okay? So this is what you would think about with a block, right? You can give it inputs, and it gives you the right answer. That's what you want. And in almost every case, that's what you want, but it's not necessarily what you can get, because some problems are just way too hard. And that's why partial correctness is also significant, okay? That means the same thing as total correctness, except there's no guarantee that you're ever going to report back. Okay? So if I ever give you an answer, it will be right. But I may not ever give you an answer. Yeah? That's essentially what it's saying. So for example, uh, let's see. Perfect numbers. Does anyone know what a perfect number is? Ah, nice. Oh, man, someone does. Okay. So a perfect number is a number. This is like a number theory thing, right? If you take a number, 24 is a perfect number. If you take every factor of that, so 1, 2, 4, and the factors of it, <laughs> and you add them all together, it actually gives you the original number. That's a perfect number. Fascinating, right. No one knows right now whether or not there is an odd perfect number. No one's ever found one. So you could write a function to find them, right? You could write a function that says find a perfect number, and if it's odd, let everyone know. It might report. If it does, it'll be right. But it might never report because there's no, no one can prove whether or not one even exists. Okay? That's one example. There are also a really interesting category of algorithms called probabilistic algorithms, which are exactly what they sound like. They give a certain chance that their answer is going to be right, which sounds totally useless, right? Except they're not. What's the situation right now where we accept that something may or may not be right in, in computation? Weather, exactly. I think weather's like the best example weather ever. But you can also think of things like predicting the outcome of elections or, or doing things that are kind of probable by nature. Weather's a really interesting one because, well, weather and, I guess, predicting outcomes of, of political races are both interesting because there are so many factors to consider that 
humans wouldn't even know what the list of those factors are if you could build a program for such a thing, right? So what we have are probabilistic algorithms, and they say, I, will, I give you a certain chance that what I say is going to be right. One interesting thing you can do with this is if you have the ability to predict weather accuracy with 80%, how could you increase that rate using the same algorithm? Possibly. You could actually run it multiple times. Run it a lot. Run it a thousand times and just see what happens. Right? And just see if that actually gives you a feel for how accurate your algorithm is going to be. It may not tell you I'm going to be 80% accurate, but you just run it a thousand times, see what happens, and then you can kind of, you can get a feel for what the accuracy is. Okay? Probabilistic algorithms, they come in handy a lot. A lot, a lot. And we may actually talk about this more later. I'm not sure. Cool. The concept of an al algorithm has been around for a really long time, really, really long time, well before computers, okay? However, the computational equivalent, what we refer to as an algorithm, has only come about with the rise of computers. And it's typically a term reserved for computation. There are well-defined procedures, a specific set of steps that take inputs and produce outputs, just like a recipe, okay? That's probably the best analogy there is. We're constantly dealing with trade-offs in these algorithms. Some will be better for some reasons, some will be better for, for other reasons, and that's, some of the, that's part of the decision we have to make when we're designing software, is thinking about how we want to optimize those trade-offs. And then correctness is also an issue. You also need to wonder whether correctness is something you need, or just a high probability of being correct is, is okay. Those are the major nuggets. And I think we can just call it there. So you guys have a great day, and we'll see you next time.